As if a virus sweeping the globe isn't unsettling enough, apparently it's being used as a recruiting opportunity by extremists around the world. Here to explain, in Atlanta, Georgia, we welcome Mia Bloom, professor of communication and Middle East studies and a member of the evidence-based cybersecurity research group in the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University. And Professor Bloom, it's good to have you back on TVO again. We had John a few years ago. It's good to see you. You hanging in there? I'm hanging in there. I, I hope that you and all your viewers are healthy and continue to be so. Thank you for saying so. I want to start by reading something that you recently wrote. Into this public health crisis step extremist groups. Their instinct to capitalize on people's misery and suffering is consistent across the ideological spectrum, from right-wing extremists to violent jihadists. That instinct is on full display right now. Let's start there. How would you characterize this opportunity, this pandemic, and what it represents for extremist groups? The extremist groups are capitalizing on COVID-19 because what it does is it accentuates a lot of the um, existing conditions in which they flourish. For example, we know from the FBI director, Christopher Wray, when he was talking about the rise of right-wing extremism, that there were certain factors that exacerbated these conditions. And these factors included everything from um, social isolation or an economic downturn or the perception of government overreach. All of these things now are on steroids with COVID-19 because a lot of people have been staying home. They might feel more socially isolated. People have lost their jobs or their incomes or their incomes have decreased. And so that's going to exacerbate their economic anxieties. And then of course, what many of these extremists are doing is they are stepping into the void and they are providing uh, like different kinds of social services, reinventing themselves as good guys. And so all of these factors put together allow whether it's right wing, left wing or jihadi terrorists to exploit the pandemic. The strange thing is, I can't recall a time in the last 20 years where we have seen less media coverage of terrorists, ISIS, Al Qaeda, all of that kind of stuff. There's almost none of it in the newspapers or on television these days. So it certainly conveys the impression that it's all settled down because of the pandemic, but you say not so. Not really. I mean, we saw it, for example, with the attack against the Sikh temple in Afghanistan. And um, I don't know if your viewers saw, but uh, just yesterday, the Taliban attacked a maternity ward and they killed babies. So we are seeing a huge uptick in attacks both from different groups like the Taliban in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We're seeing ISIS re-emerging in places like Iraq and Syria, but also throughout Africa. And the interesting thing that many of these jihadi groups are saying is that COVID-19 is a punishment from God against non-believers. Al-Shabaab, which is the group in Somalia, has even gone so far to say, Muslims won't get COVID-19. It's only for the non-believers. Hmm. Let me ask about a different group here, the, um, the so-called incels, involuntarily celibate. What sort of messaging are you seeing from this group of generally, you know, alienated, young, angry men? Well, you know, for, what's interesting is that I've been doing a research project for about two years with John Jay College on these incels. And so although, you know, we look at Alex Manassian in Toronto as the prototypical incel, when you look at the ideology, you can go all the way back in time, you know, back to the 1990s, the attack at Concordia University in Montreal, for example. But what the incels are looking at in terms of the social distancing is they're seeing it as a validation of their lifestyle. So in many ways, they are gleeful that the fact that uh, sort of normies, people who are not incels, who are not involuntarily celibate, now have to be celibate or now have to socially distance. Or this idea that by wearing a mask, uh, someone who is, you know, not a perfect 10 can pose as someone who's better looking because half their face is covered. So it is really interesting to see that the incels are celebrating COVID-19 on their um, discussion groups, their web forums. They seem to really be excited about it and, you know, in the most disgusting ways. And how might they try to use this pandemic to commit attacks? 
It's important to emphasize with incels that the vast majority of incels are not violent incels against others, that the vast majority of incels are actually more violent against themselves. And so when we're looking at incel attacks, that is a very small tranche of the incel community. And I, I, make, I basically say this because, again, the isolation, the economic downturn, the perception of government overreach may also exacerbate their pre-existing depressive natures. And so it is important to say that I don't know how this necessarily increases the likelihood of incel attacks, partly because until we stop socially distancing and there's crowds, it makes targeting a little bit more difficult. But it definitely allows them to recruit more and to fill their message boards and their social media platforms with hateful rhetoric. And so what it does is it gives the perception that they've been prescient, that they were able to identify these different trends within our Western society and that they've been right all along. But as far as violent attacks, we are probably going to have a small lull as far as attacks across the spectrum because it's harder to attack a group of people other than at a hospital um, when we are not collectively getting together in large groups. How about other extremist groups, Al-Qaeda, ISIS? Islamic State, call them what you will. So the jihadis are, their messaging is a little bit different. What they've done is they've basically said, you know, we've been telling you that the apocalypse is coming and we have predicted this all along. So you have a limited time to react. It's this notion of, you know, fear of missing out. If the end of the world is near, you have to join us now and you have to perpetrate an attack. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to convince people who themselves might be infected with the virus to go someplace and infect others. So it's, and this we're seeing on the right wing as well, um, for the, what, the extreme right wing and the neo-Nazis, they're also pushing this notion that you want to get other people sick. So they're trying to weaponize people who have the disease and, you know, encourage them to spread it to others. So in a bizarre kind of a way, this pandemic has been a recruiting bonanza for these groups? It's been a huge bonanza because if you think about the fact that lots of people now are at home on their computers for much longer periods of time than they were before social distancing, they are in themselves more vulnerable. So they're more isolated, they are seeking answers, and of course, the extremists on all sides of the spectrum are capitalizing on this by spreading conspiracy theories, by um, blaming certain individuals or certain groups. And of course, what they're doing is they're blaming the groups that they disliked anyways. So from, let's say, ISIS's perspective, the first attacks that they made, let's say, talking about the Chinese. Well, this is God's wrath because of the way that the Chinese government treats Uyghurs, Chinese Muslims. And then when it went to Europe, again, it corroborates their worldview that this is a punishment because they reject God and that they are not supporters of that interpretation of Islam. At the same time, what they also said is, you know, your martyrdom is inevitable but it's better for you to be a martyr fighting the non-believers than die at home alone with COVID-19. So this is a way in which they are not just increasing their attractiveness to people who are online and feeling perhaps very discombobulated by this, these events, but also giving people this limited time, like you better do it, do it now. And then the final issue, and this we've seen more in places like Malaysia and Indonesia, where the ISIS and Al-Qaeda linked groups there, because people are spending so much time online, they are upping their degree of sophistication with online recruiting. They're adding functionality to their websites. And so we're not just seeing more propaganda, but we're seeing much higher rates of sophistication. Hmm. I guess apropos of your answer about incels a few minutes ago, we should make the distinction that um, there may be extremist beliefs, and then there may be extremist beliefs that turn violent. How important is that distinction in your eyes? I think the distinction is huge. I think, you know, when we talked about for years, starting in 2015, when I was invited by President Obama to the White House to talk about um, countering violent extremism, mm -hmm. we need to make the distinction between what's in people's heads and hearts versus what they do. And for me, ultimately, the problem is not what people think in their heads, because you're it's very hard to change people's hearts and minds. But actions can be changed. 
And so if someone sits at home screaming at their TV and has, you know, hateful feelings towards a group, it's kind of their own business. But it's when they try to encourage people to act on it or when they themselves act on it that I find that problematic. And so I do think that we need to make the distinction between what people think and what people do. And what people think ultimately is their own private matter. But would you agree that the pandemic and the isolation that comes with it uh, is making people who are, you know, potentially vulnerable to this uh, in an even worse predicament? Absolutely. And I think it's exacerbating because of the feelings of isolation, because of the feelings of, you know, doom and gloom, the lack of hopefulness for the future. And, you know, we have more questions and we have answers about this pandemic and when it's going to end. I think that ultimately people are more vulnerable, but they're also more vulnerable to regular mental health issues. I mean, we're going to see a lot more depression, we're seeing suicides even among medical professionals. And so we're seeing the effects of the pandemic in terms of psychosocial implications across the board, not just for the extremists, but even for the people who are, you know, trying to save lives in hospitals, ambulance drivers, people who work, you know, in public service or in the service sector, it's really difficult for everyone. And so I think that we need to create better outreach opportunities, off ramps if people are feeling depressed. We need to encourage them that there's no stigma, but they can get help and they can get telehealth online or on the phone. Hmm. And in our last 30 seconds here, Professor Bloom, uh, you know, so much of the deprogramming or de radicalization uh, that professionals attempt in order to get young people out of this, out of this, uh, well, predicament that they find themselves in. So much of it needs to happen face to face. And of course, that's impossible to do right now. How much more difficult is it for them to do those jobs when it's all basically got to happen virtually now? A lot of the deprogramming and these interventions that we've heard about either in Canada with Mubin Sheikh or um, in the United States with uh, Christian Picciolini or um, other people who are in that space. <clears throat> A lot of it initially starts online, um, either in messaging or, you know, in like direct messaging on encrypted apps or these kinds of Zoom calls. So I think that it affects more the second phase rather than the initial contact and building trust because people don't meet right away anyways. A, a colleague of mine, Shannon Martinez, does a lot of work in this space where she helps women get out of neo-Nazi groups because she previously had been in a neo-Nazi group. And a lot of the first two phases of contact, building trust, all of this is usually at a distance. And so it, it may not have the same negative impact as we worried about until the final phases, because a lot of what can be done face-to-face -face can also be done online by providing people opportunities to leave a movement, by giving them support, even by giving them different kinds of off ramps, where to get more information um, as they move away from extremism and towards, you know, a happy regular life. Hmm. Professor Mia Bloom from Georgia State University, it's really good of you to join us on TVO again. Uh, be safe, be well, and I hope to talk to you again down the road sometime. Well, I hope not, because it means that there's a problem, but I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I, hope, I hope to someday be completely irrelevant and just a small footnote in history. Uh, I think I know what you're saying, but I don't think that's going to happen. Anyway, take good care. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.